only mode. Good morning. My name is Janie Montblanc, and on behalf of the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange team and our partners, I would like to welcome you to this webinar titled Restoring Biological Soil Crusts in the Great Basin, presented by Dr. Jane Belknap, research scientist with the USGS. Before I introduce our speaker, I want to let you know that you may ask questions of the speaker or me at any time during the webinar by typing your questions into the questions pane of your control panel at the top right of your screen. I will keep questions for the presenter in the queue and field them after the presentation. I also want to let you know that whatever you do in your control panel does not affect the webinar presentation, so you are welcome to type a test message or test your audio at any time during the webinar. If you're having problems with your audio, please open your audio pane and check your audio selections. Now I would like to introduce our presenter. Dr. Jane Belknap is a research ecologist with the U.S. Geological Survey in Moab, Utah, and is recognized as one of the world's authorities on soil crusts. She has been invited by many governments to train their scientists in soil crust ecology and travels throughout the U.S. training federal agency staff and managers on management of soil crusts. Over the past 20 years, she has published 105 peer-reviewed articles and books on soil crust that include a BLM technical reference, co-authored with three other BLM scientists, and the only comprehensive book available on the topic. Welcome, Jane, and thank you for being here today. Thank you. So now how do I get my screen back? Ah, show my screen. <laughs> okay. I see it. Oh, good. Okay. So um, I'm assuming that everybody that's on the webinar knows why biocrusts are important, um, but just in case I need to remind anybody, I did a really short summary here, and the other reason for the short summary is that the things, the reasons biocrusts are important are exactly the reasons we want to restore them. And so we need to understand what it is that we're actually trying to restore in terms of function. So I think it's worth a quick over a quick summary of what it is that we're trying, what functions we're trying to restore. So first of all, and probably most importantly, is that soil crusts are very important in prevention of erosion. Um, this is for many, for many different reasons. The biggest one is that the sheaths are very sticky, and so they hold on to soil grains, as you can see on the panel on the left, and then these sheaths go between soil grains and link them together and they make particles, and aggregate particles that is, therefore they're too big for wind or water to move. And so they can really, really stabilize the surface to the point that they don't move um, with wind and water erosion. Now this ability is dependent on the biomass of the sheath material, so if there's not very much, because it's just a really thin crust that's recovering from disturbance, then it's not going to have much resistance, but if it's a really well-developed soil crust, um, they literally can be wind and waterproof in terms of erosion. Here's another close-up of the way they can aggregate soils. Um, these sheath particles are very, I mean, these sheath materials are very rigid, but they're also highly brittle. So that sheath, if stepped on, will crumble, which is one of the problems with soil crusts. Here's, you can see, a really gluing a surface together of what is just loose sand. And so they can be tremendously good at stabilizing even moving dune fields. So one of the reasons that we care about soil stability is dust. Um, it's becoming a really big deal lately. It's a bad juju in terms of human health, in terms of um, highway fatalities, in terms of health for respiratory distress, things like that. Um, it's also a big issue for dust on snow. Here's a picture of dust on snow where you, that pink is areas where the snow melt rate has been accelerated by up to 30 days. That has huge implications for the amount of water entering the Colorado River, as well as for uh, managers that are trying to decide when to let water go in dams upstream. Um, so we're looking at a greatly decreased amount of water entering the Colorado River when we have early snow melt. So dust is a really big deal that we need to all start paying attention to as water supplies get more and more limited in the desert southwest. They're also 
that ero keeping erosion down is also maintaining soil fertility. So first of all, a really well-developed soil crust is very good at capturing dust that's full of nutrients. And the reason is both because those sheaths are sticky, but also a well-developed crust is very rough. So that roughened surface, when the dust falls on it, it's harder for it to leave again um, because it is retained by the roughened surface. Also, because soil erosion is eroding soil particles, those soil particles can contain nutrients attached to them. And so if you can reduce that wind and water soil loss, then you're going to retain nutrients rather than losing them. And lastly, they're also that roughened surface captures water. And the more water you can keep local in a system, you're going to enhance plant litter decomposition rates and nutrient transformation. So a lot of nutrients are not in forms available to vascular plants. They have to be transformed by bacteria and fungi and other microbes in the soil. And so we need water in order to do that. And these roughened soil surfaces really help with water capture. And here's a picture of that. Here you've got water that would otherwise be flowing straight off of a very smooth surface, but this bumpy surface actually captures the water and holds it. And so you again, you know, you have this twisty runoff pathway instead of having a flat one. The other way that these guys really help soil fertility is they contribute directly both carbon and nitrogen by fixing it. So the carbon and nitrogen as it occurs in the atmosphere is not usable by vascular plants or microbes but these guys can actually um, create compounds that makes it available. And so this is especially important for nitrogen in desert ecosystems. There are very few organisms in desert ecosystems that can fix nitrogen. And um, these soil crusts can be a dominant source in a lot of systems. So what are the pro so that's a summary of, of why we care about where soil crusts are and a summary of the functions that we want back if we are now missing them. So what really is the biggest problem that we have is that lots and lots of Western landscapes have received heavy use over the last 150 years. And soil crusts are missing or much lower kinds of cover on organisms than they should have. So really our big question is how can we enhance this recovery and what can we do about it? Droughts are not helping. Um, these guys are only metabolically active when they're wet. And so the more time that a surface is dry, the more time it's going to take to recover. And so one part of the problem is going to be how are we going to do this kind of restoration in the face of the droughts that we know are coming and that are only going to get worse. We also have new kinds of disturbance that are now increasing. So the, the grazing of public lands is pretty much static and has been for a really long time. Um, recreation is increasing. Energy exploration and development is increasing. We're seeing a lot of mortality of plants due to severe droughts. And we have new kinds of energy coming in like solar. And so we're getting really you know, a whole different suite of disturbance types, too, that we need to start thinking about when we talk about restoring soil crusts. So obviously, land managers have an incredibly full plate. Um, dealing with basically bare soil surfaces. And bare soil surfaces are a huge issue um, because, again, you've got a lot of erosion. You've got, you don't have bumpy surfaces, so you don't have retention of surface materials like water and nutrients and seeds and organic matter. Um, and you've got vegetation that may or may not establish like it used to be without the soil crust. So we really do need to figure out ways that we can get them back. And the question is, can we, in fact, rebuild the soil crust? Um, I've talked about all these things. And the answer is um, absolutely yes. So let's go back and start at the beginning about how you might build a soil crust. And we're going to do this by looking at the successional sequence that happens in nature. When you have a surface that has been barely, I mean, newly created that is bare now, you basically have the first guys that move in are these big, giant, filamentous cyanobacteria dominated by microcoleus, the species that is illustrated here in these photos. These big, giant filaments are so big that they can handle moving sediment. So sediment can bury them 
um, up to a centimeter, and they can move up on top of that in 24 hours. So they're very good at moving across mobile substrates, and so they're great at stabilizing surfaces for other species that aren't so good at moving. So they're really, really a great first platform um, to help the colonization of later successional species. So when we talk about building a soil crust, I, first we need some sort of stabilization. Oops. Second is then we need the ones that are more stress tolerator. And the reason we want these guys, and this is mostly nostoc and cyanema for western landscapes, is because these guys fix nitrogen. Microcoleus is a great stabilizer, but it's not really great at fixing nitrogen. These guys are great at fixing nitrogen. And as you can see in the picture, they're also dark colored. And so they have a lot of sunscreen shielding pigments in them. And they actually will come on top of microcoleus and shield it from UV. UV is very detrimental, and um, microcoleus can have a hard time living without this sort of cabana on the beach approach of these darker colored cyanols. And here's a little picture of that where you've got these darker guys, light, smaller species, nostoc and cytonema is the brown one, nostoc is the green one, coming in on top of that microcoleus and shielding it from UV. This is a very common thing seen once you have the stabilizers stabilizing the surface enough for these later successional species to come in. So that's the cyano mix that we would be looking for. And then third, you want to bring in the mosses and the lichen. The bad news is we have no way to grow lichens in the greenhouse. No one's been successful at doing this intentionally. So to remind you, lichens are a combination of a fungi and then either a green algae or a cyanobacteria. So you can take the fungal spore, you can stick it in a dish, you can stick the algae right next to it, and nothing happens, and nothing happens, and nothing happens. And we have very, very few examples of any sort of successful combination to make a lichen, and they seem to be more haphazard and random than anything intentional, and certainly are not the species that we're looking for. So we have um, focused our efforts on mosses because mosses are very easy to grow. The other nice thing is mosses have very high carbon fixation rates. Organic matter is very important to soils. It increases water holding capacity. It increases microbial activity. It's just it's a great thing to have in your desert soils that are otherwise very low in it. And so mosses are great contributors to the ecosystems. The other thing mosses do is they actually protrude above the soil surface. So when raindrops hit the soil surface, which is the major source of soil erosion, they don't ever hit the soil if, they're, if there's a moss in the way. They just hit the moss. And so mosses are great at protecting soil surfaces from erosion. So there's lots of reasons that we'd like to have the mosses in the crust that we're building. And then the problem that I talked about is that lichens, they are super duper to have there. They fix nitrogens. We really like them. But just like mosses, they actually protect the soil surface from raindrop erosion, but I said they're just almost impossible to grow intentionally. However, as I will show you, occasionally you grow them by accident, and that's a real plus. So can we really restore biocrust? Um, and the answer is absolutely yes. Um, we've done all these four steps, and I will go through them and then talk about what we need to know more about the different steps. So there's four ways. One is that you just stabilize the surface and you wait. Two is that you collect them from somewhere else and crumble them on to another place. Three, you collect them, you bring them into a greenhouse, you expand that collection, and then you inoculate. And fourth is that you take organisms out of a crust, you culture them in the greenhouse, you grow up lots of them, and then you take them out to the field and inoculate. So here's some examples. This is the passive stabilization the Chinese have been doing for the last 50 years. They basically just go out, they put straw in these squares. They've actually done this on moving sand dunes and made it work. And after 30 or 40 years, they get that picture on the right, which is the best developed soil crust you could imagine. Depending on how much it rains, that result can actually be attained in about 10 years. But since most of the areas that we are concerned with in the, in the western US is much lower rainfall, um, than the examples that are well established in 10 years. We're more on the 40 to 50 years time scale if we just make the passive stabilization, which is not 
really something I'm excited about because I want to see stuff happen in my lifetime so I know it actually worked. So the second thing is that crumbling. It's very efficient. It's very effective. We've done it in lots and lots of places. Basically, you scalp the material from one area and you bring it to another area and you dilute it by you know, like 1 to 20 or 1 to 10 so that you're applying. So if I collect from one square meter, I apply it to 20 square meters. Um, and of course, the more you apply, the faster it recovers. It works great. It brings in all the species. This is how you can get lichens immediately um, because you're bringing in crumbled up lichens. And so it's extremely effective. The downside is you've got to actually go and collect material from somewhere and disturb it in order to bring it in somewhere else. Good news is you're not collecting you know, a one for one, but the bad news is you've got to collect somewhere that's, um, that you're going to disturb. The way that we've done it most effectively is finding areas that are going to be disturbed anyway, running in there, salvaging the crust, taking them over right away to the spot that we're restoring and crumbling them on, and it works incredibly well. Long-term storage is not great. These guys will photosynthesize when they're wet, no matter what. If they're in the dark, they will respire themselves to death and die, so you have to store them in very, very long, thin, shallow windrows. Um, and it takes up a lot of landscape, and that's often not practical. So storage is not the greatest thing. It's the best if you don't have any other choice. But this is the way that we've really focused on um, over the years is crumbling not just moss, as this picture is, but whole communities. The sec third way that I talked about is to collect this material and then grow it up in the greenhouse and then put it back out. And in this way, you can collect somewhere around, that you can enhance it like 50 to 100 times. So you're collecting far less material um, than you would be with the direct crumble approach. And you're you know, enhancing it in the greenhouse and then taking it out. This works great. Um, it, you do need a lot of greenhouse space, however, if you're going to do this at any sort of scale, which is the rate limiting step here is that when I am thinking about restoring soil crust, I want to do it on hundreds of thousands of hectares. I mean, I want to think big about this, because we have a lot of landscapes to deal with. So something like the first three methods really is only going to work um, on smaller land scales. Although I have to say the Chinese have put those square, straw squares out over 10, oh, thousands of miles of roadways. So they haven't done this in a small scale approach at all. They've done it on a gigantic scale. So that passive approach is possible because it's pretty cheap. So the fourth way is, um, oh, so I just wanted to summarize that the problem with number one is that you have to wait forever. The problem with the next two is that you've got to collect the field materials. And so our biggest hope for this really is to do number four, and that's to pick out organisms out of a crust, culture them in the greenhouse, and then inoculate them. Um, this works. It's been done at a very large scale in China. It's been done for biofuels in the US on a very large scale. You can see these raceway pots. So you start out with this little um, bile that you have up in the left-hand corner. You just expand it through time until you hit the raceway ponds that you can see in the lower right. Um, and there's a place in China that was producing 20,000 kilograms of dried cyanobacteria in three months. So it can be done at a very large scale. This is, to me, the answer to this. Um, but we have a lot of research that still needs to happen to make this commercially viable. And that's what I'm going to focus on for a minute here. So first, we, need, we, we know how to culture them. But we're still at a very small scale in the US. And even the Chinese, even though they could do this huge level of stuff, they had a lot of issues around um, reliability. A lot of times the cultures would crash. They'd get in, um, invaded by species they didn't want. You know, there was a lot of issues that they had not quite dealt with. So we really need to work more on how to get the biomass of the species we want faster, cheaper, and in less space than we currently are growing it. Because this, you know, to get this commercially viable, those are requirements. We really need to understand more about maximizing field survivorship. This is where every effort in the US has failed. 
and where most of the efforts in China has failed, although I visited one place last year where this was not an issue at all. But what they were doing there was they were raising them in those raceway ponds, putting them into trucks and spraying them on directly, which makes that, you know, then you're thinking water. Water weighs a lot. Water is very bulky. But um, so that's something to think about. We also need to understand um, the delivery mechanism. And here's maybe we do have to do it in water. Or can we grow them on top of soil? But that's heavy, too. Um, can we just dry them down into flakes and smash them up? And then how do we get them out over large landscapes? Um, my vision is to put them inside C-130s, you know? I mean, like, or put them in the airplanes that people use to put fire retardant and spray them out of fire retardant airplanes. Um, or, play, or airplanes where they're broadcast seeding, um, have it mixed in with cyanobacteria, things like that. So we don't have any idea of these larger scale efforts and whether they would work or not. And then obviously we would need to monitor what worked or didn't work. So here's in China an example of that truck that they used. They said they have 50% to 100% greater survival if they do not ever dry the material down. So basically, if they have to dry it in order to take it to far away places or because weight is a matter, then they put down two to three times as much material as they would otherwise. So you know that's a real key here about how we might get survivor, survivorship up, but it's obviously going to be limited to roadsides. So we, again, you know, we really can do this, but what we need is some sort of sustained funding and effort in the U.S. that we've never had. There's been uh, probably about 10 research projects that have looked at this. Um, as I said, they've, we've always been able to grow them at a small scale. Getting them out and having them survive has been the real um, point where we have failed. Um, but again, it's all at a small scale, and I think other than restoring maybe an oil pad or something, it's not at the scale that we need. So I wanted to just talk briefly about mosses and about why to include mosses. I talked a little bit about them, but most people don't think about them when they think about restoring soil crust. They just they think of cyanobacteria. Um, because they think of mosses as a later successional community. And one thing that we've been thinking about, those of us that are working in the restoration community, have been like, well, why not put everything out? Why do this in steps? Why start with microcolius, the stabilizer, and then bring in the later successional guys, and then bring in the mosses? Why not just put everybody out all at once? Because then the microcolius will be there to stabilize sites. The nostoc and cytonema will be there to fix nitrogen, and the moss will be there in order to fix the carbon and protect the soil surface. Um, and so we have been doing some specialized work looking at mosses, and it's been funded by the BOM. Um, thank you. And it's been extremely successful. So let's see, that's, we've done that. And here is a picture of efforts going on in Flagstaff where all sorts of different ways of growing these mosses was done to see which technique works the best. You know, how, do you add nutrients? Do you not add nutrients? How often do you add nutrients? Do you add water? How often do you add water? All the different combinations that could be thought of. Um, and what was found was that you could put a tiny bit of moss on a dish. This dish has about 4% cover. You could then put different treatments on it, but the optimal treatment in only four months, you had a dish that was fully covered, and it was not only mosses that came back. Um, oh, I've got that in a later slide. And basically, if you look at this slide here, the best treatment of all, you could choose. You could either, so along the bottom here is the amount of um, watering that was done. I mean, I'm sorry, amount of nutrients that were added in the days of continuous hydration are the bars going up. So, you know, basically the optimal thing for the one species of moss was to have three days of continuous hydration per week and then let them dry down with a monthly fertilization. Or you could fertilize them biweekly and have them hydrated only two days. So it really depends on what your resources are and what works out the best. For the other species of moss, there was a treatment that really stood above the rest, and that was the biweekly fertilization and two days of continuous hydration. So again, if you wanted to grow both species, that would be the treatment, because both of those species um, 
really responded well. This is just the first cut at this, and so there's also lots more um, combinations to look at to see whether, in fact, this is the best way, and there's other species, too. Um, the other cool thing about this experiment is that in those dishes, there was a whole lot of cyanobacteria, and it was the kind we wanted. Without even inoculating, we already got the cytonema that fixes nitrogen, we got the nostoc that fixes nitrogen, and we got a lot of them, and lichen showed up. So, you know, and basically this was coming off of these little pieces of moss leaves. So really, you know, there's, there's the inoculum of these guys are hanging out on moss leaves, so when you inoculate the moss leaves, you're getting all sorts of different species coming in, which is super. Um, and so really, this is probably an excellent way to be thinking of how to grow these later successional species that have really been problematic up until now. Now, you'll never get the kind of bulk that we could hope to get for the cyanobacteria cultures. Um, my biggest hope with the cyanobacteria, cyanobacteria culture actually is the biofuels world um, because they're really focusing on cyanobacteria and growing them in huge, huge towers. And so um, I'm hoping that they'll come up with the perfect recipe for growing cyanobacteria and solve our problem for us. But um, that would give us every reason to focus in on lichens and mosses. So um, the other question that we have, of course, in growing any of these species is, are we, do we have material that's local? You know, we don't want to be bringing in any exotics any exotic genetic material from one place and sprinkling it somewhere else. Um, for Microcolia, Cytonema, and Nostoc, we're pretty lucky. There's very little genetic diversity. Um, these guys are microbes. They blow around in the wind. They're pretty much everywhere, and so we can pretty much take material from anywhere and apply it. I mean, we're not anywhere. I'm talking about the western U.S., but especially the Colorado Plateau and not be worrying about anything that we're bringing in weedy-wise. In terms of mosses um, and lichens, we don't have the genetic analysis done like we need in order to make a statement like that, and so we need to do that. Um, what we do know is that the populations do respond differently um, depending on where you collected them to months of cultivation and the kinds of treatments that they receive. And so here's just a quick graph here showing you that if you have a population from northern Arizona, that's the purple line, you know, the max cultivation time to harvest it is four months because it didn't grow very quickly for a while. On the other hand, if you collected somewhere from even further south, it grew very quickly in the beginning and then kind of leveled off. So we need to understand a lot more about the genetics and when the optimal harvesting time is for individual species, um, for the mosses and also probably for the lichens, and get some better idea of what we are putting back out. So um, in summary, what we really know from this is that we do know that different populations grow better and faster, but we don't know. We tried to relate it to the monsoon index, but it doesn't work. So we need to understand better what these different populations are responding to. And the, the idea we really want to find populations that are better nursery stock without being genetically different enough that we're worrying about being weedy. And this is the same actually for cyanobacteria. So there's lots and lots and lots of, of very minor variations in microcolius, for instance. And some of them just grow better in the lab than others. And so um, this would also be something that we need to do with microcolius. It would be finding those strains that really grow the fastest. Understanding stress tolerance in these different strains, because we really don't understand um, what they are in the lab. And that may or may not correlate to what's really good stress toler tolerance out in the field. And then again, harvest time and understanding harvest times. So I sort of said this um, throughout this talk, but in summary, where do we go from here is that we just really need a lot more experimentation to understand better that optimal culturing technique. And this is for all the different species. We really need to 
we need to streamline this or we're never going to be able to scale it up to the degree that we need to in order to get soil crust back where they need to be. We really need to test, you know, not just water regimes, that's an example, but fertilization, you know, even um, microsite preparation, like how do you prepare a site? What do you do? Um, do you want to roughen the surface? Do you want to soil surface? What time? Do you do it in the fall? Do you do it in the spring? There's really a lot of different um, conditions that we need to look at for the field. Um, that species combination, we suspect, like I said, that if we grow everybody together, they'll be happier. Um, and how do we scale up? How do we scale up to for cyanobacteria? How do we scale up for mosses? And then how do we maximize this field survivorship? This really is a big deal. And it takes that same kind of thing where we put these um, laboratory-grown guys out under all sorts of different conditions and see what happens. We've done this. We had some money from DOD this last few years. We did some experiments using the crumble technique with all sorts of different treatments. And the great news was that they did just as well with no treatment as they did with extra water, extra shade, extra fertilization, which is great because that makes it a lot cheaper and a lot easier to do. So that was good to know. Um, but one of the concerns is if you grow them up in a lab, they are not under full UV, they're not drying out really fast. Is that a problem for them when they first get put out? So we need experiments like that in terms of maximizing field survivorship. And then we need these large scale trials. And I mean large scale, you know, on the many acres level so that we can really get an idea of how and we can get these back. We know, for instance, that these guys recover much more quickly where it's under a shrub. Well, you know, so does that mean that we should just focus efforts under shrubs and then leave the inner space and let them crawl out there on their own? Do we just put them out everywhere? I mean, there's just a million questions to be asked in terms of this large scale monitoring to success because, frankly, the only restoration we've ever done is at the acre scale or less. So thank you for your attention, and I would just, I'd left a little, hopefully a lot of time so that we could have a lot of questions. Wonderful, thank you. All right, if you have questions for Jane, please type them into the questions pane of your control panel. The first question is from James Hereford II. How disturbed, and this is referring back to um, when you were talking about methods two and three, I believe. How disturbed were those sites? Most of the disturbance I deal with totally takes away all this material, and we have nothing left but subsoils that are highly saline. Right, and so that's where you're going to either have to bring in material from another site, or you culture it and you bring it on. Um, you're not going to be able to just stabilize the surface and wait. It's going to take forever. Um, and this is, we do this a lot where we go to a place because at least at the acre scale, you can always find landscapes that are being disturbed. So we go and we salvage the crust and we bring it on. Um, one thing about the saline soils, though, is if they are hyper, hyper saline, then you got a problem. These guys are really good at dealing with salinity, and it's not an issue for most of them. But if you've got, you know, like, we did an experiment where we put produced waters back on the soils, and most produced waters are hypersaline, and we couldn't grow anything once we did that. So, you know, if it's just a subsurface soil, they're probably fine. But if lots of waters or other things that have a lot of salinity have been put on them, then we got a problem. Great, thanks. Okay, the next question is from Molly Boyder. Um, let's see, is there anything in the presentation that would not be translatable in the Upper Columbia Basin, i.e. Eastern Washington State? No, not at all. This will work everywhere. Um, and that's really the point of this, all this work we're doing is that we don't want something that just works in one place. And in fact, on the Columbia, Columbia Plateau, you're a little better off because temperatures are cooler and moisture is a little greater than it is in a lot of the hotter, drier places like the Mojave. So things are going to go much faster and it'll be a lot easier to do 
Great, thanks. Matt McCoy asks, how do soil lichens compare with rock lichens? Could they colonize from rocks? Great question. Um, sometimes. So rock lichens really want rocks. Soil lichens really want soils. But sometimes soils are so hard that they fool the rock lichens into thinking they're rocks. And so, for instance, gypsiferous soils sometimes have rock lichens growing on them because the lichens actually think they're on rocks. Um, but in general, the answer is no, um, that they really do know whether or not they're on a rock because a rock, in the end, is a lot more stable surface than a soil. Great. Allison Dean asks, where are your experiments based? Are you imagining a network of greenhouses doing these experiments in different desert environments? Um, right now we are in Tempe, Arizona and Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, we would love to have, I mean, yes, that is the vision, is that it'd be kind of like the seed expansion, what, what do you call it when they grow out seeds? It would be sort of like that, you know, where different places are able to handle the different um, soil crust organisms. Because we're really not sure the role, I mean, we don't want to have to heat and cool things. And so if we can grow these in places where the environment is what the soil crust organisms will be put out into, then we don't have to do that extra step of having, you know, a lot of fancy greenhouses. So we are growing the, the crust that we're going to put out in the Sonoran Desert, we are growing in the Sonoran Desert. We're growing the ones we're going to put out on the Colorado Plateau on the Colorado Plateau. Um, I think, you know, if we really got to some giant facility, then you're going to have to heat and cool it anyway, so then it might be a, a lot less imperative that you do it that way. But right now, that would be my best way of doing it, because it's going to be a while before we get to some gigantic facility. Thanks. Bod Steger asks, are crusts inversely related to elevation and plant densities? Oh, okay. So crusts fill in between vascular plants. So they don't, you know, yes, there is an inverse relationship between plant cover and crust cover. Where you have a lot of plant cover, you don't really need soil crust because they, the soils are already stable. You already have plenty of carbon. You have plenty of protection from wind and water erosion. So, you know, it's, they're not something that I focus on in a forested system or a scrub community, anything like that. It's really this lower elevation desert and then tundra. They're very important in the tundra. Um, so where there is a high vascular plant cover, they're really not that big of a player in the ecosystem. Great. Henry Sun asks, why do the cultured cyanos survive better when sprayed in a liquid suspension than in a dry form? Don't they dry out anyway? Um, I have no idea. I, all I know is that um, when, because yes, they will dry out all way, but my guess is that if you apply them wet, they have the ability to tack themselves down to the surface and actually even crawl underneath a sand grain or two depth so that they don't get fried by the UV when it comes around again. If you apply them dry, they're just going to be sitting there on the surface and they can either blow away with any sort of wind, and they're going to be sitting on the surface and degrade from the UV because they don't have any protection. That's my best guess, but trust me, that would be called guess. <laughs> okay, Stephanie Frund asks, have you seen differences in results on burned sites? Um, we have only done the crumbles on burn sites. And as long as there's not a lot of ash blowing around to bury them, no, it works great. If there's a lot of ash around, then you've got the burial problem. Um, and that's happened and hasn't worked great. Thank you. Dale Stewart asks, Did, do you find a need to reculture BSCs after large fires? Or do they weather the fire and recover on their own? Um, the, the, organ, the crusts that are underneath plants that burn will burn up. The crusts that are in an inner space that's big enough 
that where temperatures were never got that hot, then they'll be fine. So you can have big islands of fine crust that will recolonize the site, or you can have a place that's pretty toasted, depending on what the vascular plant cover was and how fast the fire spread through it. Um, and whether, you know, so like a shrub that just sits there and smolders and burns, everything underneath will be toasted. But if it's a fire of just really light fuels that zips through and there's a lot of um, spaces in between the plants, so you'll have a lot of little islands that are fine. Great. Bod Steger asks, have you been able to reliably predict crust presence amount and type by a soil series or type? Uh, kind of, sort of. Um, where we've done it, that's the problem, is we haven't done it in very many places, and it's been very successful where we've done it. So I think the answer is yes. Um, it's not just soils, though. It also has to do with um, moisture. So, you know, you need, so if you have a GIS layer of soils, you also need a layer of climate, so you have some idea of how wet it is and vegetation, because again, back to the former question, if you have lots of vegetation, you're not going to have very many. Um, but it's pretty much driven by soils. Um, the, where the climate comes in is that if it's too dry, you're not going to get the same diversity of lichens and mosses or cover as you would where it's moisture. So that's why you need the climate layer as well. Thanks. Pamela Pavic asks, should herbicide applications for weed control be tailored with chemical selection and timing to avoid damage to biocrusts? Yeah. Um, the problem is we don't have very much experiments with different herbicides on soil crusts. Um, there's every reason to imagine that some, I mean, a moss is a plant. So with mosses, you're going to have to be super careful because you know, things like Roundup and things that kill plants are going to kill mosses for sure. The microbes, the cyanobacteria and the green algae um, and the lichens, we need to do a whole lot more testing before we know how each kind of herbicide affects them. I suspect these guys have been around for three and a half billion years. I suspect that they'll be very resistant to some and not to others. So I think it will be pretty herbicide specific. Great. Nika Leepak asks, you mentioned some species being weedy. How big of a concern is this? Um, when I say weedy, it's just weedy in terms of when I go out to a soil surface in a typical southwest desert, the soils are dominated by cyanobacteria. But there are green algae in there. And if I left those soils wet in a dish for three or four weeks, I would have a very large population of green algae. It's just that if I walked out at any particular point in time, the soils are generally never that wet, and so I never see that kind of population. But when I go into a liquid environment like a cyanobacteria culture, I can all of a sudden grow vast amounts of green algae over the cyanobacteria I want if I'm not really careful. So they're not weedy like bromus. <laughs> They're just weedy in the proportion of which they occur naturally. Great, thanks. Jesse Brunson asks, it makes sense to move crust material from one site that is going to be disturbed to an old site, for example, a well pad. But what do you do for a dispersed disur disturbance such as grazing in an area that will continue to be grazed? Yeah, that's where I need my airplane inoculations. Um, and, and this is a huge challenge, and, and I don't want to brush this off at all because it really is a huge challenge, is I think the point is that you need to keep the soil crust level to the degree that you need the soil stability. So that doesn't mean that you have these nice, beautiful, bumpy, incredibly biodiverse soil crusts everywhere you look. There's, you know, that's great but it's just not practical over a lot of landscapes that are grazed. Or oil and gas, or vehicle for recreation. You know, there's just, there's a lot of settings in which that's just not going to work. So I think we need to think more about soil stability and soil fertility. What level of soil crust cover do we need to get to that and then maintain that? I think I could say that much of the federal lands 
and I include Park Service and all, when I say that I mean all inclusive BIA, all of them. A lot of those landscapes have been degraded past that, but land management is getting to the point where we are now controlling those sorts of impacts so we can go back in and restore these areas and then maintain them at that. And so that's where I'm hoping for this landscape level restoration and that's where we really need to grow inoculant at large scales and get it out at a large scale. And maybe that large scale is you know, a whole bunch of people with backpack sprayers, you know, out there doing it. I really don't, I'm not joking when I'm saying the, the fire retardant bombers. It's the perfect answer, um, you know, for these large areas of dispersed use. And the idea will be to get the crust back to a level that can then be managed for with the different grazing allotment plans. Great, thanks. This next question is related to the last. Sarah Culpa asks, so now you have developed soil crust to be applied on the ground. Are there studies to look at disturbance tolerances? In other words, what kind of protections would you need to enable them to survive something like grazing impacts? Um, yeah, we, we've got a bunch. Um, it's going to be very site specific because it's very soil specific. And so, and I don't mean site specific like you have to do it every single place. but for every sandy soil under a certain climate regime, for instance, or every shale soil under a certain climate regime, we're going to need to get more information. But really, it's about the timing and intensity of the disturbance. So an example would be, on a sandy soil, things are much more resistant when they're wet, because the cyanobacteria and the lichens actually are kind of stretchy. But in a clay soil, as you all know, if you put cattle out on a clay soil, it's a disaster when they get taken off, um, when I mean when it's wet, because the hoods just punch down through and churn it up. And so it really depends on the different soils and climate, but, um, and the intensity, like we know, you know that we need to keep the animals moving through the landscape and not have them concentrated in one area. So, I, you know, I, it's really it's at the field office level in understanding the resource and understanding the demands being placed on the resource, where the water is, and all those things. But it really can be done. That's my point. Is it's not you're not going to have these just you know astonishingly wonderful soil crust. But I don't think that's something that we get to have. Great. Steve Popovich asks, Have you tried field implementation over snow? Can that work? Is there an optimal time of year to apply? Um, we have not tried over snow, but I bet it's a great idea, um, just like sagebrush seed and other seeds. Because the point is you're going to want them to be around when, um, you're going to want them to be around when there's water around. So I think, you know, it's a really good idea, but no, we haven't tried it. What we have tried is fall versus spring, and fall is much better um, because fall is when we have the ability to, I mean, it follows when we're going to get more moisture sooner. Great, thanks. Roger Ferriol asks, how would seeding vascular plants be combined with crust restoration? Should the two occur at the same time? Yeah, I think so. I mean, it depends on how it's applied, obviously. But um, if you're putting the seeds out, there's my imagination would be that you could either encode, I mean, encase the seeds with cyanobacteria on their on coating them. You could just put them down in the same little place, you know, where you put the seeds. Obviously, if you're drill seeding, it won't work because you don't want them down under the ground. But you know, you could have a box of dried cyanobacteria that's going on down next to them too. So it's really going to depend um, on the vascular plant seeding, but that is. The, would be the ultimate for sure. Great. Dave Pike asks, are you spreading dried crumbled moss or are you using a moss slurry? We're doing dried at this point, um, but we have been then, the, well the crumbled stuff is always dry. We put one watering afterwards sometimes if water is available and that's always been that way. The stuff that we're growing in the greenhouse and then 
that we're putting out, we haven't put out yet, but we will be putting it out both dry and then with one watering to see what works the best. Great. Mickey Chamness asks, how much time would it take before seeing beginning populations spread enough to start holding the soil, and how long would it take to have a fairly functional crust? Um, this is just absolutely dependent on how much material you put out. So if I put out 10 times the inoculant, I will have recovery 10 times as fast. Um, and so that I can't really answer just because if I put one to one, you know, with a nice soil crust and I put a one-to-one -one replacement, I can have it almost instantly. But that, of course, isn't very realistic. So, you know, if we've gotten really nice recovery of barren soil in about five or six years, if we crumble one to 20. So I figure, you know, that you're in a, in a place where it rains like 250 millimeters. If you're really down, like in the southern Mojave, then you're going to wait a lot longer. Great, thanks. Valda Locke asks, do you know of any greenhouse operations in the northwest Great Basin region that is currently taking moss collections for grow outs and inoculations? No, I don't know anybody who's doing this at all except for the Flagstaff folks. It would be great if someone did. Yeah. Oh. When I I'm sorry, Jane, I accidentally cut you off. I should, I should add that there's a lot, yeah, there's just, there's a lot of effort in China, too, I should add. Um, and so that is actually, that climate where they're doing it in China is much more similar to the Northwest than the Flagstaff situation. So we have a lot to learn from the China efforts, and they're, they're growing the same species that we have. Great. All right, Allison Dean asks, is there currently a way to purchase material, crumbled moss, to be added to an aerial seed mix? Oh, I wish. <laughs> <laughs> no, we're, we're really still trying to figure out how to grow them to get enough bulk. So, I mean, we're really at the beginning stages of this. Great. Bob Steger asks, if different sites have the same soil series and types that are formed in the same climate influences, do you see a different expression of crust than you would have expected? You, you shouldn't. I mean, it's it, because it's really those two things are what are driving it. Um, unless, you know, I mean, there's certainly individual landscape settings. You know, if you're at the bottom of a slope versus at the very top, you might get a little difference. But you really shouldn't get much difference. Great. All right, well, that was the last question. We would greatly appreciate it if you would take our three-question survey of this webinar that will appear after the webinar has ended. A recording of this webinar will be sent to you automatically through the GoToWebinar system tomorrow and will also be posted on the Great Basin Fire Science Exchange website um, in the near future. With our ninth webinar in this series, titled Evaluating Strategies for Increasing Native Plant Diversity in Crested Wheatgrass Seedings, presented by Kent McAdoo, will take place next Monday the 30th. If you have more questions regarding this webinar or have requests for future webinars, please email or call me at any time. Thank you all for your participation today, and thank you so much, Jane, for your presentation. Sure, it was fun. All right, great. Thanks for all the great questions. <laughs> all right, have a great day, everybody.